this next piece. We got the Disney earnings call coming up uh, in three days, uh, Wednesday, August 9th. We'll be covering it right here live. And Pro and I will be here. Um, Jonas will be here. I think it'll just be the three of us that day. Uh, we'll be we'll be going over kind of bit by bit because we've been we've been waiting for this now for three months. And man, the last two earnings calls have not been <laughs> great days for Mister Iger, have they, Pro? Well, I've I've never seen any kind of earnings calls ever like what they've had in the past two. So I can't wait to see this one. Christine McCarthy is not returning, of course. We've got somebody new who'll be doing the this reporting will be there. The first one without Christine in a, in a yeah, while. Yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, these have not been the standard. These are not, I mean, these are so different than, than your typical business report that I, I can't even imagine what this one's going to be like, especially because we suspect, although we don't know, mm -hmm. that this one could be sort of heralding in a less viable Disney, perhaps. You know, it may, mm -hmm. it may reveal that this company is really struggling in three sequential quarters. Yep. Chat, I'm sorry. I see people asking about 5 p.m. Did if I, if I said 5 p.m. on Wednesday, I apologize. Uh, no, uh, it's it, August 9th, Wednesday, right here. I think it's going to start. We will start at... It usually starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time, right? Well, they start at 4.30 Eastern. We will start our show at 4 Eastern. Yeah. So 4 Eastern here, earnings call will pick up 30 minutes into the show. Um, so in any case. But yes, I apologize if I misstated that. But... Let me bring this up, Pro, because I wanted to get your thoughts on this. I did a video on this a few days ago, and I want you to kind of chime in because this is this is but a a piece of the problems for Disney. Again, another Forbes article, uh, Forbes Fortune magazine. So many of these places have just been taking Disney to task uh, on this stuff, um, and I think y'all have 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 all seen this by now. I'm assuming, right, guys? Yep. Okay. So they talk about the four flops of 2023 that cost Disney a billion dollars. And one of the things since the last earnings call... I didn't see this, but I saw this thing about this valiant um, something or other guy on Fox News. <laughs> well, that's this is actually a new article from two days ago. So this is a whole new set. Um, but what this is, is that Caroline Reed... Wait, it was Vigilante Renegade. That's what it was. That's, that's what it was. That's You're right. Caroline Reed, who digs up all of these United Kingdom financial reports, or sometimes I just refer to them as tax returns because it makes sense for our big U.S. audience here when I say that. Profit and loss statement, whatever you want to call it. But they have to file these returns to get the tax credit, the film tax credit, back from the U.K. So, it, in fact, it, it's a tax return. Um, but what they're doing here, Caroline Reed goes back and she pulls in all of these U.K. entities that are responsible for uh, containing the production on paper, at least, of a Disney project or any project from Universal or anybody else. If you film at Pinewood Studios, you film at Shinfield, you film anywhere in London, you want that film tax credit, you got to file these returns. Caroline Reed has come back and pulled up the numbers here, how Disney spent a billion dollars on four flops in 2023. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Little Mermaid, Indiana Jones, Secret Invasion, okay? She got the returns for these. Uh, Little Mermaid's uh, UK entity name was Sandcastle Productions, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, Pym Productions 3, or Pym Particles, uh, Hank Pym, you know, always these clever names, Indiana Jones, slipped my mind, I can't remember which one that was, but the point is, you look there, $964 million, that was the net spend, that was after they received uh, film tax credits, all total between these four productions, close to $200 million. In, in in film tax credits, that nine hundred and sixty four million dollars spend does not include post production on Indy, Little Mermaid, and Ant Man and the Wasp. Uh, exactly. Yep. So there's at least another oh two three hundred million easy. Well, that is not. It's in also there. missing. So, it's it's missing Elemental here, and even though Elemental is doing good on a hold, Elemental no. wasn't done in the UK. Okay, I got you. So gotcha. that's why. Yeah, no, no. Just, I mean, you know, I'm just for the audience. It's a great question. The reason Elemental's not on here is because that is produced by Pixar, which is in California. But, so but it's still that wouldn't show up on the report. But no, you're right. It's added yeah, it's, to this mess. Yeah. If you if, if you add all of the flops together, to, you know, regardless of where they are uh, performed, what you what you wind up with is, I believe, in the past year now, we're up to what 1.3 billion in losses. Mm -hmm. For Disney at the box office alone, I'm not even including Secret Invasion because I don't know how you 
you know, I, I don't know how you consider the monetization of it. Uh, from everything we know on streaming, at least with Netflix, they look to see how many how many subscriptions did it add, and they use their own metrics to figure that out. I don't know what Disney Plus is doing to figure out how bad Secret Invasion performed, but I mean, as bad as you could, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I, I think the box office, you know, you've got Ant-Man and, and the Wasp, Quantumania, you've got Little Mermaid, you've got Any Jill and Dial of Destiny, Elemental deserves to be on there, Haunted Mansion now deserves to be on there. Yep. And so uh, this is, uh, you know, I, I appreciate this being put forth. It's underselling just how bad things are, though. Oh, yeah, it gets it's going to get worse. And that's why I'm going to do a follow up video uh, later on uh, once the summer kind of winds down here in the next few weeks. And we're going to go back and look at all that. And then I may have to do a third one again at the end of the year, because, I mean, 2023 itself is just terrible. And when you talk about like, again, Haunted Mansion, most of that was filmed here in Louisiana. Now, there is a there is a place that I can pull up some of that data. And I think somebody had one. I did not know that. Yeah, I didn't. I did not realize it was actually filmed in Louisiana because most of the stuff. Now they do a few outside uh, shots, you know, it's, on location. Shot in New Orleans. Yeah, but but most of the shots or, or most of the film is is green screen CGI, uh, you know, inside the the mansion, quote unquote. So oh, I, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. That's that's very the, cool. I don't remember how much of it was done here, but I know. I mean, the the, the house and the a lot of this, the, the outdoor scenes, a lot of that was very much there. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was a lot of new Orleans and Louisiana. In fact, I think I want to say that like, as, as kind of a promotional thing. And I thought this was clever that Disney had even had like a Zillow listing for the haunted mansion house. Right. Right. Like the haunt, like, you know, come and take a look at it. I forget. They made the street in new Orleans where they put the house and then come take a look at it. And, you know, certain disclosures may be haunted. It was just kind of a clever marketing thing. I thought that was one of the, that was one of the, more shrewd things they've probably done recently but needless to say getting back to this now they've spent way too much money and we've seen too many articles about this videos like mine that i guess have blown up uh i've never heard people on earnings calls the q a folks when they call in from goldman sachs from jp morgan chase uh from whomever actually bring up questions about box office that is rare uh but it's, I promise you it's going to happen this time. There's no way around it. Uh, Disney's going to talk about the box office. I can't imagine we won't get at least one or two questions on this because there's a lot of problems that Disney has. And again, this is a small ticket item for Disney when it comes you know, to the you know total might overshadow that? revenue picture. What might overshadow this that we don't know yet? This is the variable. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, this could go either way. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it could be legitimate or it could be a lot of smoke and mirrors and we don't know at all. Mm -hmm. But those Disney Plus subscriber numbers, that's the variable out there that we have no idea what's going on. Right. And depending on how big of a shift it is, if there's any shift at all, that could overshadow even the box office. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. just have to wait and see. They could they could come out and claim that they've added six million subscribers. Well, that would that would change everything. Or they can come out and say we've we've dropped a million, and that would change everything. I'd, I'd be surprised if we see an addition, a net addition of six million. I think we're going to see, if anything else, once again, just like before, we're going to see another net loss, I think, that will almost entirely be attributed to Disney Hotstar in India. Um, mm -hmm. I yep. think that trend is going to continue. They the North died. America numbers. That's what, that's what we, the, the people in the know, that's what we're watching to see Disney is what core. happened here. Yep. Yeah, all core. But North America and then all global core which is basically anything but India. Um, last time Disney dropped about, I think it was two, maybe 300,000 subs in North America, because we even commented, like, how did that happen? They lost 300 million subscribers in the fiscal quarter that Mando Season 3 premiered. That's bad. That was, the, that's, that was always the biggest show that Disney Plus ever had, and they lost subs in the quarter that that, that third season came out. Like, that, that shouldn't be the case. So then you really have to ask yourself, like right now, we're in the fourth fiscal quarter. We're still three months away from seeing this earnings call. Is Ahsoka going to move the needle at all? Probably not, given that. Um, you know, is anything I think else? if Ahsoka fails, I mean, well, you know, we've kind of, we've, we've kind of joked about how dead is dead with Lucasfilm and with its properties, yeah. right? I mean, Indiana I was going to say, do you, do you want to talk about that dead. a little bit? Because I know we've been, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, we've had... Jason Ward, which is name over there at making Star Wars, talking about is Mando going to wind up being a a movie instead of a TV show? And I, I think 
anything's possible at this point with the writer strike. I just found that topic interesting, but since, well, since you kind of we kind of I think deviated I think that, uh, the chances of of the season four being turned into a movie that it's very very low. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, well for one contractually John Favreau probably is obliged to have that be a season. And it's probably financially written in his contract in such a way that it being a season, you know, he would have to permit it be made into a movie. And then they would have to uh, rewrite whatever uh, contractual obligations they have with John Favreau in such a way that it would be favorable to him to allow it to become a movie. Would he then be the writer and the director? Well, probably not. Does that, does it in some way uh, compete with what Filoni is doing with the Mandoverse movie? Well, we don't know. And, and the other issue that would make it very difficult is at this point, after just what they've been through with Willow and then with Indiana Jones, the Dial of Destiny, every time Lucasfilm could potentially put out a new movie, it also has the potential to significantly damage the brand and expose it to the public revelation of just how unpopular it is. So if you're Disney, why would you ever bring in more risk and that's vastly more risky to put it on, on the box office versus on your streaming platform. Why would you invoke significantly more risk at this point from a studio that has proven time and time again that they will fail in spectacular terms? I, I just I don't see the upside to Disney, although, for all fairness, mm-hmm. Disney seems to choose the option which has no upside lately. <laughs> that That's true. And I know there's always questions about Well, there must be some type of malfeasance at Disney itself, because how can anybody do this or do that or, you know, make these choices? Look, believe me, it's easy to think that. But when you're when you get to be as big as Disney and you've ridden the wave of success that Disney has for so long, 10 years, basically uninterrupted of complete dominance from like 2009 to 2019 across the board, whether it was Pixar Marvel, uh, uh, Disney Animation Studios, live action adaptation remakes they did. Whether you liked them or not doesn't matter. The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, these were all billion plus dollar mega hits. Um, Drove a lot of business, drove a lot of licensing. Disney got used to being able to spend enormous amounts of money on making these movies, more so than on average most other studio. And you got to remember what we're seeing today that's collapsing. A lot of these pictures were put into motion or greenlit even before the pandemic. I mean, that. so you're you're looking at this slow trickle out of of stuff that was already, you know, greenlit when they were at the height, the peak of, of success with this. That's why you're seeing now where guys like Iger are coming out going, um, gonna have to cut back on some of it. we're not gonna be able to spend this much on stuff anymore we're gonna have to find some other way to do this you know there's a deer in headlights lately i mean he, he really he is yeah he really is nothing seems to be really going right from that end and if you think about it the valiant mm-hmm. he comes into disney in terms of taking over at a time when the disney renaissance is already underway he had nothing to do with that renaissance he comes in and he uses the renaissance and the resurgence of disney to buy other studios and companies that are currently experiencing great success. Yep. They come in and they experience their great success, you know, continuing that at the company. But then following that, that movement, and that rides us all the way up until about 2016, 2017, and for Marvel all the way until 2019. But they begin to integrate his business and creative philosophies, and the company has sunk in spectacular form. And I don't think he knows what to do. You know, he can't buy any more successful entities to bring in. That's been his uh, his mm-hmm. trump card that he's played over and over. What do you do when the thing that you've done is no longer available? I don't know. I don't know what he can do here. He's not, you know, he's like a, uh, you know, he's in a completely different habitat than where he succeeded in the past. Ready. 